Hey, hey, welcome back to Have You Heard, the official podcast of Nichols College Athletics. My name is Pete DeVito, and today we sit down with brand new Nichols College men's ice hockey head coach, Mike Parnell. Mike is a 2017 graduate of Nichols. He's a former captain and a conference champion. We talked to Mike about taking over the reins of his alma mater, his coaching journey, and putting his stamp on Nichols hockey and continuing the brotherhood. Hope you enjoy. We're joined by new Nichols College men's ice hockey head coach, Mike Parnell. Mike, how do you like the sound of that so far? Um, yeah, I think I've just really appreciated all the support. I think for me, especially for my family, it's a huge accomplishment for us. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been really enjoyable. I've enjoyed just being able to get back to work for, you know, when you go through the process, you're just kind of in limbo. So nice to be working again. And I appreciate all the support from a lot of different people. Sure. Take us through what that call was like when you heard from Nichols College that they were offering you this position. Yeah, I was ecstatic. I think being somebody who's played here, coached here, and just really knows what it means to be a part of the the school and the hockey program, it was just an honor for me to continue to be a part of it. And it means a lot to me. Um, and I really love my experience. And I'm just honored that I get to ensure that our guys continue having a great experience while they play here and go to school. When did you first hear that Parker Burgess was taking another offer and was leaving Nichols? Yeah, so I was actually, uh, the day before, we, we were all done recruiting, and he said, hey, take some time for yourself. And um, I was actually in Massachusetts, and I was on the golf course when he called me. So I went from uh, being pretty relaxed and kind of just enjoying some time for myself, and then all of a sudden realized that there's a lot of work to do. So um, yeah, I was out golfing. Sure. Um, and with that phone call, obviously, was this something that immediately said, okay, I, I want this job. I want to jump in and take the reins of this program to do it. Um, what was kind of the initial reaction? You mentioned you went from a little bit of enjoyment to you got a lot of work to do. Yeah. I mean, I would say just instantly, just naturally kind of my personality, the, the uh, flip switch for me. And I just kind of got into work mode. I knew uh, there was no question that I wanted this job. I wanted to continue to be a part of, of Nichols and what it means to play here and go to school here. And like I said, it's something that means a lot to me. And it had such a positive impact on my life that there was no question that I wanted to be the next head coach here. So I just started getting ready and kind of, you know, having some phone conversations to prepare for kind of the interview process and what to expect. And I have a lot of really good mentors who gave me a lot of really great advice and uh, I definitely learned through that process how to kind of handle your emotions and really just stick to the business and, and those type of things. So, uh, again, I really appreciated all the support from a lot of different people. Now that you've had a couple of days to kind of reflect back on, you are the head coach at Nichols now. This is the school that you played for. Do you look at any points during this past season where maybe you you felt Parker was grooming you for this job or maybe telling you things or, or showing you how to do things that were going to help you out when you landed a head coaching job? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I think, you know, that's one of the big reasons why I came to work for Parker is not necessarily to take this job or that it was planned out. But I think three years ago, I was really fortunate to work with Lance West, Eric Largen and Lincoln Wynn up, up in Alaska. And they were all really good mentors. They challenged me to grow. And I think anybody that knows me from when I played here to me presently, um, I've grown a lot. My personality has changed a little bit. I'm still myself, but just understanding that it's all about learning and you have to be willing to grow. And I think Parker did a really nice job here, won a championship and, you know, the kids have a great experience playing for him. It was one of those things when he called me a year ago to come work with him. I knew that there was a lot that I could learn from him and he was unbelievable. He gave me opportunity, responsibility. He allowed me to voice my opinion and that gave me an opportunity for a full year to grow. And that's something that I really appreciated and, I didn't know that it was going to be this job uh, or this soon, but um, I think Parker was unbelievable in allowing me to to grow and, and pick his brain and see how he does things, and that was something that meant a lot to me. Sure. How was this interview process maybe different than ones you've had in the past for other coaching jobs in the sense of this is a school that you were an assistant coach at this past year, so you knew a lot of the people 
on the search committee at the school that you'd be meeting with. How different was that than maybe in the past when you'd been to a university for the first time and just met everybody? Yeah, I mean, I've never really had an interview process, to be honest with you. It's one of those things that um, when I was just looking to get a start, um, being a player who didn't play Division One, didn't play in the NHL, it was important to me to get as high up as I could and really try to put in some roots and, and learn and work with players who are really good. And in Alaska, that <laughs> they just said, well, we don't really have much for you. And, and I was like, I don't care. I'll drive out there and make it work. And just whatever I can do to learn would be awesome. And at Trine, I just kept calling Todd until he finally offered me. I think it was just so that I would stop calling him every week. And then at Nichols, uh, Parker and I were very close. So we had a relationship and, you know, it really wasn't an interview process. So I think whether you do or don't know people, it's one of those things where there's a lot of emotions involved. You're super excited about the opportunity, but you're not trying to get too excited in case it doesn't work out. And, you know, you're also a professional. You're trying to make sure that if you don't have this job, you have another job. And so it's just one of those things that it, it was my first time going through it. And I learned a, a, a tremendous amount. And it meant a lot to me that there were a lot of coaches out there that were willing to help guide me through it, that have experience. And, you know, again, I, I've said it a lot throughout this process, but there's just a lot of people who are helping and that just makes everything a lot easier. So um, it was a, it was a fun experience and, and ended up with the result that we wanted, but definitely the first time I've gone through it and very different than every other job that I've taken. Sure. And we're going to dive into each of those jobs as we go along with this podcast here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this recruiting class. So you came, you've been back at Nichols for years, the assistant coach. There's 13 incoming freshmen, if I that number still stands. Uh, it's mm-hmm. the largest class, I believe, in eight years. And that class of 13 was Alex Larson, Frank Butler, Tyler Beasley, Sean Fleming. There's some Hall of Famers in there for sure. Won a couple of championships. So a very big class. Uh, for, talk about bringing in 13 freshmen, which is almost double the size of last year's recruiting class. Yeah, I think the reality of it is, is, you know, we had a tremendous finish to our season. And one thing that hurt us was depth. Um, we, we ran out of bodies. We had guys that were playing hurt um, and they were bruised. And, and I just think for us to have a little bit more depth. So if we get in that position, we, we have the ability to slot some other players in who are healthy and give them an opportunity, to pull some weight. You know, we're really proud of all of our guys I mean, the way that they played at the end of the year was incredible. It's something that I've never seen in my lifetime. And I think, you know, for us, we just felt if we can add a little bit more depth and and the class is a little larger, that it kind of protects us the further we go through the season. And also early, you know, gives us a chance for those guys to maybe get healthy before the the big push. So I think when you look at this class, uh, they're going to complement the players that we have returning one thing that I'm super excited about is the guys that are coming back are, I, I trust and respect them. I think they understand what it means to play here and they're going to play a huge role in getting those guys up to speed. I think all the guys who are coming in, they're all different, they're unique, but they're all a hundred percent what, what Nichols hockey is about. And I think we want players that want to be here and, you know, our roster, if you take a look at it, it doesn't matter where you come from. Uh, you know, I just think we want guys that love hockey um, that kind of want to be at Nichols and know what we're about. And I think that's what excites me about this class. We have great returners who are going to get them up to speed, and these guys are going to be able to come in and, and complement the players that we have. So I think, you know, we were able to check a lot of boxes with the class that, that we are bringing in. Sure. And with that, uh, several years ago when Nichols did go to the NCAA tournament, they won a game against Fitchburg State, which is a local school in Massachusetts, without a kid from Massachusetts on their roster. That's changed a little bit the last couple of years. This recruiting class that's coming in, where are these kids from? Maybe the furthest reaches and how many locals do we have? What are we looking at? Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, I think, again, like, you know, we, we do have some Massachusetts players on our team now. And for us, it's really not like a mass or not mass as much as it is best player available. And, and we don't care where we have to go to find them um, as long as you know we think that they're what we're kind of about. I think, you know, if you look at this class, we have – you know, Mateus Backstrom, you know, who's from Sweden, or, or Philip Yorkman is from Sweden. We also have, you know, Tommy Bertrand, who's from Quebec. And, you know, we have guys that are from all over. And I think that's part of the fun, though, is, you know, when you come here, you know, you're going to get to meet a lot of people. And that's been one huge benefit, you know, for me being a coach now is uh, when I go to New Jersey, I can stay with, uh, you know, the Brennan family who I played with here, or, you know, if I'm 
going somewhere, I can reach out to those people. And I think it, what it makes that experience, these guys, they are away from home and they spend a lot of time together. And I think that's why they have such great relationships, but yeah, our class, we, we have players from Florida, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Vegas. Um, so they're, they're coming from all over. Um, but I think at the end of the day, uh, we're, we're just excited. And I think, you know, they're going to compliment the guys that we already have. And, uh, I think that everybody's going to get along well and, and be able to, you know, have some great relationships, create some great memories. And that, that's what it's all about. And you, of course, came to Nichols from Minnesota. You started your collegiate career at uh, Wisconsin River Falls. You played one season there. Talk a little about that season. Um, probably didn't get as much playing time as you would have liked. No, um, I would say coming from the North American League um, and being somebody who was raised and brought up where I really wanted to play Division One hockey, and that's all I thought about, um, I, I didn't have that opportunity. Um, and I think going into my first year of college, I had double hip surgery and probably thought I was a little better than I actually was and came in a little overweight and just didn't play very much because I wasn't playing very good. And I think the one thing that was amazing about that was I realized that there's a lot of other things that are important in life, not just hockey, uh, the relationship you have with your family, um, surrounding yourself with good friends, people that are going to you know be a positive influence on you. And that's how I ended up at Tickles, to be honest with you, Pete. Uh, a friend of mine, Paul Prescott, was going there. I played Minnesota. junior hockey with him in, in Aberdeen, South Dakota. And he called me and, and he said, you're coming here. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not even sure what Nichols is. Like, I don't know the coach. I've never visited. I don't know any of these kids. And he said, it doesn't matter. You're going to come out here. You're going to get a 4.0. going to win a championship. And you're going to get a great job. And uh, I didn't get a 4.0, but uh, graduated with honors, won a championship, played the national tournament, and um, got a dream job in Alaska as a young coach. So um, a lot of that credit, we still laugh to this day when I, when I see Paul and his family is I came to Nichols and I, I, you know, I had never even been, I didn't know where it was, but you know, a lot of that goes to Paul because he was a great friend and looked out for me. And that, that means a lot to me. Sure. You, you get the phone call from Paul. I want you to come out to Nichols and play with me. What was it like letting the coaching staff at Wisconsin know you were leaving and what kind of relationship did you have that year? It seems like again, you battled some injuries again, probably didn't play as much as you wanted. Did that, was that a, a strained relationship at all or how did that work as you went along and, and what did you learn from it? Um, that's going to help you probably as a head coach now. Yeah, I would say that obviously if you're not playing, you probably, you know, aren't super excited about coaches or, you know, some of the things that are out of your control. But I think the reality of it is, is, you know, one thing I've talked to all, our, all of our kids about is, you know, you know, best players play. And at that time, I wasn't one of our best players and I didn't play. And you don't understand it as a player. Sure. It, felt, it felt personal. But I think at the end of the day, um, the conversation I had with them was just honest and upfront. I think that's a huge benefit to our guys, their maturity. You know, they move away from home at 17 and they come into college at 21 and they have a lot of great life experience and they've been traded and had some difficult conversations. And I was fortunate that I played in a league where I got traded a few times and you got to have those conversations. So it was really for, for them. I just said, First and foremost, I'm not doing very well in school here. Uh, there's a lot of distractions. And, and to be honest, like I, I'm going to have to remove myself and insulate myself at a school like Nichols, where the professors know your names. They're going to know when you're not in class because we get a text message or an email saying that you weren't in class and you, your teammates go to class and they care about doing well in school and they're motivated. And, um, you know, I think that was something that was great for me, changed my life. It was such a positive experience when I ended up at Nichols, you meet a lot of really good people and, um, you know, it's really no harm, no foul with the staff over there. I still bump into them at showcases now. And I think it was more of just, Hey, let's be honest. I'm not playing very good and I'm not doing well in school. So I just have to make a change for me. And, um, yeah, they were, they were totally understanding with that and, um, you know, it's always a little awkward, but, you know, it, it was a good conversation and, and they were great about it. And I think they understood and it, it worked out great for me. Sure. We spoke a little bit earlier about the depth or lack of depth that Nichols kind of had this past season. Guys are playing hurt and banged up. When you arrived at Nichols, there was a plethora of depth. There were five lines of forwards and four deep pairs. So what was that like coming in that first practice and looking around and be like, geez, this is going to be a hard lineup to crack? Yeah, I think... One thing being from Minnesota, we get a bad rap. Uh, we're a little naive. We kind of know 
we know what we know and we don't what we don't. So I arrived and we had 36 kids on our team and there were kids getting dressed in chairs and didn't have a locker. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously it's, it was unique and it's a little intimidating. Like, I don't even know that Worcester is pronounced Worcester. I thought it was Worcester. I'm with you. I made the same mistake. <laughs> Everybody's asking me yep. if I'm Canadian, which if you're from Minnesota, that's a little bit of an insult. And uh, like, so it, it was just one of those experiences that it was pretty humbling. Like, you know, if you want to play, you have to perform. And there's a lot of kids here that want to play. So it was a humbling experience for me. It was really good. And, you know, Paulie, he was, he was unbelievable for me. He was a good resource and helped me out and just was there for me. And inevitably you get to meet everybody and you're like, Oh, these are great people. And, and it was a lot of fun, but yeah, it was a little intimidating at first. And, you know, it was a good learning lesson for me. If you want to play, you have to play well. And, um, you know, we had a lot of success that year. So it was a lot of fun. Was there a moment during that season where you kind of had that, like you finally felt accepted or that you, we're going to be, you know, a regular in the lineup each time. Because I'm sure at the first couple of weeks, it would kind of in and out, in and out. Was there a moment like that for you? Well, I, I would say when we won a championship. Um, I mean, I only played 16 games that year. Um, and one of them was before Christmas because I hurt my shoulder. And then I came back in the second half. I played most of the games, but we had a lot of good defensemen. So it was kind of a battle every week as far as, who was going to play. Cause at that time it's, you play Wednesday and Saturday. So it was kind of like, who's going to play on Wednesday. And then depending on how you played, are you going to get to play again Saturday? So, um, you know, I would say when we won a championship, it just kind of solidifies that you were playing and that you were on a team that won 21 games and that you're going to play in the national tournament and you're a champion. And I think that, that for me was, um, it was the first time I've ever won a championship and it's a pretty special thing. Um, you know, you talk with the guys that you play with and, you know, we just have so many great memories from, from our time here that um, I would say for me, if I had to pick a moment, that was probably it just because it kind of solidifies everything. And to be honest, I didn't play that many games that year. I, I actually got in the lineup because I started a chant. Uh, the guys still do it. So some of the, some of the older guys I played with still give me a hard time about that. But Is that the Ric Flair was, chant? Was that you? Yeah. Yeah. That was uh it was Butler's idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we kind of ran with it, but yeah, it was great. So I kind of started doing that. And then it's like Swallow was in a tough spot because we kept winning and so I <laughs> s- squealed my way in there. But yeah, it was awesome. It was a lot of fun. I don't remember. Did you get in the lineup? Was that at Trinity in the NCAA? Was that you in the lineup there? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I got to play against Trinity. So it was an awesome experience. And, sure. you know, it's one of those things. It's, it's hard to get to, hard to get there. So when you do, it's it's a lot of fun. And unfortunately, we lost. But you know, it was an incredible year, 21 wins and won a championship. And some of my best friends are from that year. So pretty sure. special. Now, how is this going to help you as a player? Because that season ends, you win 21 games and Kevin Swallow, head coach, heads off to UNE to take that coaching job. So Parker comes in. So you've been on the player side of things, having the coaching change. How is that going to help you now taking over for Parker? Yeah, I think one huge be- positive for me is I just I'm familiar with the people here so whether it's you know the administration the athletic staff um, the players kind of the tradition and history that's already here I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of those things so normally when there's a new coach that comes in you know you gotta you gotta learn everything right away and try to get up to speed so it's been nice for me because I know our returning players um, recruited our incoming players and kind of know everybody at the school. Um, so I think that's a huge positive for us, you know, talking with our players. That puts us ahead of the game. And now we just kind of I have a list and just working away at it. So I think that's probably the biggest thing is I'm pretty familiar with everything. So we kind of skip that, you know, that phase where you're trying to get up to speed. Sure. Those first two years with Parker, your junior year and senior year, you won 17 and 10 your junior year, lost in the semifinals to Salve, who you had beaten the year before uh, in the championship game. And then your senior year, you win 15 games, you lose to UNE in the semifinals, and you wore the C that year. When did you start to view yourself as a leader? Were you more, would you consider yourself a vocal leader or, you know, like the Mark Messiers or the, I'm just going to lead by example, the Scott Stevens type of leader? No, I think all the guys that play with me probably are chuckling a little bit. I can be a 
a little a little abrasive and, <laughs> and loud and those type of things. But for me, it was always just I want the guys that I played with to know that I care about them, that I would do anything for them, and that really the only thing that mattered to me is that we're all having a great experience and that we're winning. Um, so I think, you know, I think being an assistant captain as a junior, you know, whether you're prepared or not, it gave me an opportunity to work with, you know, Butler and Lisi and um, Beasley and, and kind of see what it's like being a captain and when they're seniors and being a part of those conversations and you almost kind of get groomed a little bit. Um, so I would say probably my junior year when I got named an assistant captain and then um, once I kind of had an opportunity to be the captain my senior year, you kind of get to do things your way. And, um, but it wasn't very difficult. We had unbelievable leadership help, like Scotty Cuthrell, Sean Swanson, a lot of other guys, um, that won two championships here and were awesome. So, um, if I had to pick junior, junior year was a great year. Cause I got to see behind the curtain a little bit and just kind of see what the responsibilities are. Was it during that span of two years where you started to think to yourself, I might want to have a career in coaching, or was it long before that? I I always thought I was going to be an accountant mm. uh, until I got my first accounting test back at Nichols. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it was going into my senior year. I just was really trying to think, you know, what where my abilities are and where do I have a network and you know, how would I, how would I like to make my living? And when you kind of just start combing through it, all my relationships are from hockey. Um, I love it. And I just kind of made a decision that that, that was the path I was going to go. I emailed every single division one school asking if they needed a volunteer assistant coach. Um, and then inevitably had an opportunity to go to Alaska. And, you know, that was such an amazing experience and I learned so much and, I owe all those guys up there um, a lot because they helped me grow and uh, humbled me a little bit, which anybody that knows me knows that sometimes I can use a little bit of that. Let's talk about the road trip from Dudley to Fairbanks, Alaska, because you really can't drive much further in the U.S. from point A to point B than those two spots. Um, when did you accept that job and when did you say, you know what, I'm just I'm going to pack up my car, whatever car you had, I don't know, you can tell us, um, and, and talk about that trip. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was driving my dad's 2012 four-door car, and basically I, I took the job before I graduated. And then uh, in July, they said that they had some youth hockey stuff going on up there that I could come work some camps and that they would help me a little bit, earn some money. So I called my old billet dad that I lived with when I played junior hockey up there. Uh, asked Ross if I could live with him. You played junior hockey played. in Alaska? I did, yeah, twice. I got traded and then got traded back. Wow. So, uh, yeah, I played junior hockey up there. I called my old billet dad, Ross. I said, hey, like, can I come live with you? He was like, yeah, absolutely. And I was like, yeah, I, I can't pay you, though, because like, I don't know how much money <laughs> I'm getting I'm paid in here. sweatpants and hoodies. <laughs> and he was like, you know what? Like, I loved having you get up here. So, um, yeah, I left Dudley and in four days uh, just – Drove up there. It was awesome. Um, had a couple great stops along the way. I stopped and saw my parents one night. Uh, Garrett Roth, who was coaching with Bismarck at the time for a night, and uh, then Parker's parents up in Calgary. And then the last 30 some hours from Calgary, I just drove straight into Fairbanks. Um, and it was pretty wild because when I was in North Dakota, I got a call from Dallas Ferguson, who signed with the Calgary Hitmen um, in, in the WHL. He's like, hey, you know, I, I don't know. You know, you could stay at home if you'd like. You know, I think they're going to hire these two guys, but I'm not for sure. Um, so they might want somebody else. And I just was like, well, until somebody fires me, uh, it's my job. So <laughs> yeah. finish the drive up there. And um, yeah, it was an unbelievable experience. Beautiful drive. If anybody has a couple weeks, um, that'd be a fun one to take your time with. I can't say I drove to Alaska, but I did in 2006, I believe. I took a trip to Anchorage, Alaska when I was working at a, a Division One school. We played a tournament out there, so I did have a little small taste of Alaska. I'd like to go back and do some more sightseeing, but it's definitely a different state atmosphere, I guess you could say, than, than Massachusetts for sure. Yeah, it's uh, pretty spectacular. I don't know if I've, I've been a lot of places. I don't know if I've been anywhere as beautiful or as intimidating or as cool as Alaska and uh, obviously if you've been you know you've gotten a little taste of it and yeah. yeah it's so many great people I loved my time there playing junior hockey 
and uh, and coaching, and um, I, I've learned a lot up there about myself and about hockey and just a lot of different things. So it, it's it's a pretty special place. Sure. So now you're at Alaska Fairbanks. What exactly did they task you with? Had they had volunteer assistance before, or were you kind of the first one? And they said, "Well, let's see what we can give them. Let's see how good he is." Yeah, so they they have had um, volunteer assistant coaches up there before. They have uh, he goes by Rhino. He's the best, um, and so he's been there for a long time. And um, you know, really for me, it was just kind of like anything I can do to get Division One experience, whatever I can help you guys with. I remember I walked into my my first my first recruiting meeting um, with Westy and, and Large and. Uh, they were just talking about scholarship money and, and players and, you know, talking about two, three years out. And I just was like, oh, there's so much to learn. So for me, it was really just like every and anything I could do to help them out, they, they would let me do. Um, so I was really fortunate and they were so good to me and challenged me to think about my coaching philosophies and, and help me prepare. Um, so that So that was awesome. But pretty much everything and anything from – grabbing coffees to setting up meals on road trips to, you know, booking hotels for playoffs and just, just everything, whatever I could do to help them. That, that's what I was there to do. I'd always told people in my profession and I'd been to a couple of different colleges and some pro sports and, and things like that, that sometimes you learn more from watching how things are run than actually doing things. Was there anything in particular that maybe stands out that you said, wow, I had no idea that's how this went or something that you learned from watching coaches that when you took that next job, you said, you know what? This is how I want to do it because that's how I saw it done. Yeah. Um, I would say details with itineraries, um, especially when you're in Alaska, the travel is pretty extensive um, and there's a lot of moving parts. And I can tell you right now, I got a phone call at late at night from St. Cloud, Minnesota, where the team was to play the Huskies. And I didn't have price points or addresses on our itineraries. And um, so I, I learned a lot, but they were, they were really great with me. They gave me a lot of responsibility and let me help with a lot of different things. But I would say details when it comes to like itineraries and travel, and those type of things. I definitely botched a couple itineraries. Up there. <laughs> Is there any experience or game from Alaska that stands out more than any other? Um, I, I would probably just say the first home game um, that we played up there. It's like hockey is such so important up there and I remember being a junior hockey player in that town and going to watch the college team and you're just like man this would be such a great program to be a part of and I think you know when you're a part of it and you're up there and you just see the people the energy and the excitement and it's a little stressful because you know you get paid to win and you know like you just you worked so hard and you know you want to be successful that it's just all fun when the first home game comes to fruition and you get to just be a part of it. And, um, you know, it was just a lot of fun for me. I think that first home game, uh, cause I didn't travel with the team, um, just for playoffs. So like, that was like my first division one college game that I got to be a part of, which was pretty special. Did you have any other side job, side income, anything to help you make ends meet during that time? Well, I was pretty fortunate that Ross, uh, you know, bless him let me live rent free. So I I really didn't, um, you know, they were super helpful. You know, if there were some youth hockey stuff or some things that I could do to earn a couple bucks, they always gave me a heads up on it. And um, for me, it was also a huge benefit. My parents allowed, you know, me some flexibility and they helped me out. And, you know, I think I'm pretty fortunate. There's been a lot of people who have gone above and beyond to help me and whether it was the guys up there in Alaska, the staff, um, you know, or my family, I was able to just be a fly on the wall and pick their brain and, and be a part of the Division One program. So I was pretty fortunate. I, I didn't have to do anything other than just be there every day to try to help out. The season comes to a close. How do you find Trine University? How do you land there? Um, Maybe so, I should slow it down and, and say when the season, did you know you were going to leave? Alaska Fairbanks? Um, Yeah, I mean, I think when you're in a position where you're a volunteer assistant and like you just don't have a lot of money coming in and you kind of know that going in and I think the entire staff, they all 
went, would go above and beyond to try to help me. I got a call from Largy. He told me that uh, Alex Todd at Trine was looking for somebody. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just trying to find an, another job. So sure. I sent him my resume um, and just called them, you know, once a week for about a month and a half, just trying to check in and, you know, not be too aggressive. Um, and then eventually he just was like, hey, would you like to come work here? And I drove from Alaska to Indiana. I took the job April 4th. My first day on campus was the 9th. So, you know, drove down and started right away. So it was a, it was another beautiful drive. It was a long one, but yeah, just very fortunate. I mean, even like, you know, Lincoln and, and Westy, you know, and Largy all going, you know, out of their way to recommend me and help me. Um, you know, that was my first full-time job. So I was super fortunate to have that opportunity right away at such a great school like Trine. Sure. What were the biggest, I say, adjustments that you caught on to right away going from a Division One school back to a Division Three school um, in Indiana, which isn't necessarily the biggest hockey hotbed? Um, what are things that jumped out to you immediately that, that you saw when you got on campus? And I don't mean that in a negative way at any point. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, well, I think it's, it's kind of funny just because you have – uh, the, you know, Notre Dame 45 minutes down the road. And, you know, now because you're a little bit more towards the middle of the state, everybody considers it Indiana, you know, but um, yeah, I think really for me, to be honest, like the amenities that Trine had to offer a brand new rink on campus, weight room, locker room, everything was division one there, you know, in recruit, like in our recruiting budget, in our equipment budget, um, they spared no expenses. So, in, in all honesty, it really wasn't any different. Um, and I think, you know, Todd was, he gave me the opportunity to come there and he gave me the responsibility to handle all of our recruiting. And I got to go out and see just about every junior league in person and meet a lot of the junior coaches and advisors. And I think I, it was invaluable for me. It kind of gave me a network and just exposed me to it. And I think, you know, I learned very quickly receipts are important and, <laughs> you know, you got to be responsible, but yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. And, and Todd is a very knowledgeable coach. Um, he's been around, he's got great division one experience. Um, so a lot of, a lot of uh, my experience is, you know, from him as well when it comes to recruiting and coaching and those type of things. So yeah, it was, it was awesome and it worked out great. And obviously recruiting was a key piece for you there at Trine. You brought in a lot of the top scores these past couple of years. Talk about recruiting in terms of how important it is, not just to connect on a hockey level, but as a person. And I look back at some of Parker's time here where Parker likes to fish, and he was able to recruit certain kids from certain areas and sell them on, hey, if you like to fish and you like this, we have that out here. How important is it to connect on a personal level with the recruits, not just on a here's, how my, here's my system? Yeah, um, well, I'll say this. It's kind of funny because uh, Park, Parker brought me on board and we we're talking about, you know, recruiting and all sorts of stuff. And I was just so excited and so happy to be back. And I was just blabbing on. And he's just like, hey, like the kids won't care what we're doing if you if they don't know how much you care about. It. And they don't care about what you know. They just want to know that you care. And that's something that I took from Parker. And I think, you know, we changed our recruiting plan for this year kind of based on that is to get to know the kids, um, to be there for them, whether things are going well or bad. You know, I think, you know, we were recruiting players who, you know, they have family who's sick or when coronavirus is going on that they're at risk. And, you know, I think really for me, um, just trying to really focus more on on building a genuine relationship with the kids more so than to just try to get their deposit. And I think that a lot of that comes from uh, my time with Parker is the value in that. And I think a lot of the kids would talk about in their recruiting experience that they, they experience that with, the, with our program. How much sort of a difference did you notice maybe within yourself from when you were on the road recruiting at Trine to this past year at Nichols, how you had changed as a recruiter maybe a little bit, or, or I say improved for lack of a better term. Yeah, well, the, I mean, it's a never-ending in, improvement or process. Um, it, you just get better with with time. I think being at Trine, you know, you're so excited, and, and it's a lot of responsibility being responsible for the recruiting. And, you know, sometimes you're going to make some mistakes or there's a window that's open and you missed it with a kid or, 
you know, there's a kid that you really want. And, you know, there's another kid who's dying to be a part of your program. Um, and you don't really appreciate that. And then all of a sudden you don't have either of them. Um, so I think probably for me, it's just that kind of developing and trying to work more on like, um, a sensitivity to the the windows when the kids are going to be open and not open and not just focus on your evaluation of them. So just trying to develop a relationship and then hopefully you get to an opera, like a point or an, you have an opportunity where you feel like the window's open and you can get them and you do. So I think probably that's probably the biggest thing that I learned is just being a little bit more sensitive to each kid and when they're looking to make decisions and some of those things. That makes perfect sense, honestly. Uh, so now that it seems that try and ends, when did you find out that there's going to be an opportunity to come back to Nichols? Uh, well, I'm going to sound like I don't work very hard, Pete, because mm-hmm. I'm talking about how I found out about Nichols and I was golfing. And now when it came to coming back to Nichols, um, I was actually on a family vacation in Hawaii and I was getting ready to go scuba diving. I was petrified. My brother loves it. So, uh, and he just called me and asked if I would be interested. Um, it, it was a no brainer. It was a hundred percent. I loved my time at Trine. I, I really learned a lot working with Todd, but I think, like I've said before, this program means a lot to me. Um, I care about the kids having an unbelievable experience. Um, and for me, it was a great opportunity to come work with another guy being young and not having a family. I have the flexibility to move around and um, been fortunate to work with a lot of really good coaches and um, was just excited and just said, hey, whatever you can do for me, uh, obviously the best deal possible would be awesome. And then Parker really did all the dirty work and made sure that I was able to come here and be financially set and taken care of and that I would have opportunity and responsibility. And so that's kind of how it played out. I was on vacation, actually. Sure. Now let's talk a little about this past season. I don't think there's been a season in the history of college hockey like we we've, we've saw this past year. We've seen teams get in the NCAA tournament division one as a four seed and make a run. But you guys started out very unnickels like 0 and 9, I believe it was. You lost your first seven, eight, nine games, and then you have this amazing unbeaten streak to get into the playoffs. Just talk about the ups and downs of that. And Parkman and I spoke about how much he learned as a coach going through that. What did you learn as a young coach going through that? Maybe watching how Parker handled the situation. Yeah, well, starting 0 and 9 is never fun. Uh, that's the first thing that I learned. And I just think if I had to pick one thing is being positive and just trying to ensure that the kids have confidence in themselves. And it's in sports, it's pretty stressful when you make your living based on winning and losing and just how close the gap is between the two. You know, you could just as easily win as you could go in there and not win. And I think you just realize how hard it is to win and how to appreciate the wins. And I think for me, I learned a lot this year, especially working with Parker again, you know, just be positive and you know what? Yeah, it's going to be stressful, but this is what we signed up for and it's not the kid's fault and it's our job to get them going. And, you know, I think um, there's a lot of credit to be given to the leaders of last year's team. I mean, they didn't quit and they pushed and they fought for every inch and they should be extremely proud of that season because that's pretty remarkable. And, um, you know, I think it's still hard for us to believe that we didn't win a championship this year, but I think, you know, we are extremely proud of the dedication and how the guys approached and tackled the challenges that we faced this year. And that's a huge credit to them and and they were awesome. So it, it was a lot of fun, but, you know, I think those would probably be the, the key points I took away is just be positive, enjoy the work, and then, you know, handle the stress because it's a part of the gut a part of the job and of course to completely put you on the spot here this is the sixty-four thousand dollars question but what did you see from that past season maybe specifically the start of it that's going to help you coming to the season and everyone wants to know how do you prevent that from happening again but do you have any thoughts or ideas or concepts you say you know what i think we're going to try it this way or do something a little different or, or approach it this way to maybe get off to a better start any thoughts yeah i think for us i mean it's going to be a new team You know, we graduated some unbelievable players that embodied what it means to play here. And we have some new players coming in that they're going to get up to speed on kind of what it means to be here. And, you know, I think 
one thing I learned last year, um, you can always have plans and, you know, really think, oh, we're going to do this 100% different. But I think for me, it's just going to be focusing on me doing the best possible job that I can do and make sure that we're prepared as a staff and that the kids um, are enjoying their experience at the rink and their interactions with us and that, you know, winning typically sorts itself out. So if we can take care of things that we can control, that, you know, it puts us in a position to have success. And, you know, I don't think that there's any, any one thing that we could pick from last year that, oh, that's, that's the reason, you know, I think everybody had to be better, you know, whether it was a coach, a player, I mean, just everybody associated with our program, you know, we just weren't getting it done early and just stay positive and kind of manage the stress and had a lot more fun in the second half. Sure. The NFL always talks about the strength of schedule in preseason. And certainly guys were a little bit top heavy in the front of that schedule nonetheless. So you've had the job almost a week now. Uh, what have you been doing so far? And you mentioned you're home in Minnesota now. You're going to head back in a little bit. But um, just touching base with players, recruits, uh, what's going on right now? Yeah. Um, you know, I kind of when you're waiting to hear the decision and, you know, when you get the call and it's your job, I kind of just put together a little list of things. And the two most important things I wanted to do was connect with all of our returning players, have a conversation with them you know, and, and just touch base on, on how they're doing, how their summer's going. Um, you know, they're from all over. So, you know, some of our guys that are overseas, everything's open and some guys are in Massachusetts and everything's closed. So just checking in, seeing how they're doing, connect with them, um, you know, have some conversations with all the returning players and then connect with all of our incoming players. You know, I think one thing that for us was, you know, um, Parker gave me a lot of responsibility in the recruiting department. So I've seen the kids play. I recruited them. Um, So it's not necessarily like the person that recruited all of them just left. And now they have me who they don't know or have a relationship with. So um, just connecting with the the incoming players, um, seeing how they're doing. And then really kind of from there is, you know, just a lot of the, the, um, I don't know what you want to call it. Just a lot of like the, the just things that kind of have to get done, make sure all the kids have housing, make sure that they're all set. Um, You know, some of the kids are applying for visas. So checking in on that status and just everything that I can do um, to make sure that it's set and done and be confident when the kids arrive, that's kind of what I'm chipping away at now. Sure. You obviously, you recruited the 13 incoming freshmen. So you've got a, a fairly good rapport with them. As far as the returning players, this happens in any job. Anytime the boss changes, he says, you know, what's my status? What do they think of me? The conversations you've had with returning players, and obviously no names in particular, but can you speak to any kind of concerns they may have? Is it, am I going to lose my, my spot on the top six or the power play or anything like that? I mean, any kind of concerns that you've had and maybe how you ease them? Yeah, to be honest, um, our players, especially the returning players who have been here, um, they're very mature. Uh, they're, they're grown men. So they're still developing and and growing as people while they're here. But I think that's one thing is we can just have honest conversations. And, you know, the one thing that came up throughout my entire process is that, you know, I'll be a a young head coach. And, you know, I think the one thing that I've tried to reiterate to everyone is, you know, their their trust in my ability and um, the decisions that we'll be making, you know, that's just going to take time. You know, I'll have to accumulate that trust, you know, making good decisions, being prepared, having good relationships with them, making sure that we have positive, positive interactions, that they enjoy their time at the rink and just doing that every day. Then, you know, we'll kind of develop that trust and respect. And it's no different than, you know, if you're a player, you know, making sure that you're going to class and doing well and that people speak highly of you and you're being a role model on campus and, you know, you're, you're working out hard and you're doing extra work. And those are things that coaches see and then they develop trust and respect for them as players. So, you know, it's going to be, um, you know, a, a two way street in that regard. But, you know, I think the, the conversations have all been positive. We all want the same thing. We all want to win. We all want to have an awesome experience. And, you know, I think we're, we're all on the same page. So uh, I would say that's probably the only thing that's kind of come up Otherwise, it's really just kind of connecting and making sure that they're doing well and kind of touching base with them just because you kind of get put on hold there 
throughout the, the interview process where, you know, you don't really have any updates for them. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily make sense to connect with all of them all the time. Sure. Makes sense. One of the biggest things within the Nichols Hockey Program is the brotherhood that has been developed and cultivated these last couple of years. How important is it for you to, to yeah. obviously to maintain that and, and how do you keep that going forward um, with your own ideas and morals? Yeah, I, I think at all the players I've spoken to, I mean, I can only be Michael Parnell and I don't expect them to be anything other than themselves. And I think when they were brought here, it's because of who they are. And I don't want anybody to change. I don't want, I'm not going to try to change. Now I'm going to grow and learn and uh, make mistakes. And, you know, I think that those are natural, whether you're a coach or you're a player. Um, so I think really, you know, to be honest, it's just kind of like, I mean, I played it, I've coached it now. Um, now I'll get an opportunity to make more decision, decisions as I coach it. Um, but I think one thing I've reiterated to all the players is just the, the, the returning players have a huge opportunity to ensure that all the players coming in love their experience. Because for the first six weeks, the staff has limited interaction with them. And they're the ones that go to class together, eat lunch together, hang out together, Captain's live practice. together. Yeah, so I think at the end of the day, like when I came in, I mean, the guys that I lived with were awesome and they were good students and they helped me and they kind of gave me advice and got me up to speed. And, and I think that's where you develop trust and respect. And you're like, okay, these guys care about me and they want me to be successful. And so I think for me, it's just being honest with the players and let them know that they do have that opportunity and that it is a big responsibility. Um, so I think, that's going to be a big part of it. And then just be myself. Um, you know, like I said, I think just kind of being a part of the program and having played it and coached it, you know, I have an idea of, of what that should look like and we'll just kind of continue to run with it. But for a big part of it, it will be the kids. And, and I think, you know, they're, they're going to do an awesome job. They've, they've had great leadership in their time here. Um, so I, I think it'll be a lot of fun and it'll be new, but, I don't really have a, a specific one for you there, Pete. Sorry about that. No, no, it's okay. And as we wind down this podcast, Mike, I want to kind of give you this platform to speak to the alumni, speak to the fan base, speak to the faculty and staff on campus about what we can expect from a, a Mike Parnell-led Nichols men's ice hockey team, both student-athletes, the type we want to have, maybe the style of play on the ice. What, what would you like to see Nichols College be the next couple of years? Yeah, I think the most important thing to me is that we maintain our foundation, which is brothers. It's very difficult to explain what that is, but the players that come here, they experience it. They know it's real, and that's why they love the program. That's why they continue to be a part of it as they leave. Um, I know that we have a group meet chat with a ton of alumni in it and you know, guys that are 10 years out and two years out are in there. So I think that that's the most important thing that's our foundation and that's ensuring that those kids have that experience when they come here develop those relationships and then at the end of the day we're just going to work tire tirelessly we're going to do everything that we can to have success here and you know the players and i we've all spoken about it obviously we want to win there's a lot of work that goes into it so we're going to put in the work and we're going to do everything that we can to give us the best opportunity to win um, in regards to the type of players that we want, we want players that want to be here. We want players that want to compete and that want to be successful. And I think, you know, we're going to continue to find, identify those players and get them here. And at the end of the day, those are things that we can control. And, um, you know, the support from the Nichols Hockey alumni has been unbelievable. Um, you know, their confidence in, in my abilities and my capabilities has been you know, truly remarkable. And I really appreciate it. And at the end of the day, we're just going to do everything that we can to give us the best opportunity to win and maintain that foundation uh, of brothers. Mike Parnell, congratulations on being named the head coach at Nichols College. Hopefully we see you again soon on campus. Enjoy Minnesota for the time being, and we'll catch up again real soon. Thanks again for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me, Pete. I, I really appreciate it.